Ну что ты тут снимаешь, блядь? Что ты снимаешь? Иди в Since November last year, anti-government protests in Ukraine have engulfed central Kiev. These protests, dubbed Euromaidan, escalated in January and police and protesters clashed over a new and highly controversial protest law. This law could see you in prison for wearing a mask at a protest or even setting up a tent without police permission. The fighting lasted for four days and left hundreds injured and at least two dead from gunshot wounds. The clashes centered around Hereshkovo Street on the eastern edge of the Maidan, where new barricades had been set up and a shaky ceasefire was in place. So we're down at the barricades. The ceasefire passed uh, an hour and a half ago, and so far everything's still peaceful. But now, if you want to go through to the front barricades, you have to put your helmet on. This is the very front line. There's two sets of barricades here. Everyone's got makeshift weapon, shield, armor. Guys have got like bits of polystyrene strapped to their shins, bits of plastic on their arms, ready to defend themselves from the police. The protesters have built themselves a catapult <laughs> at the feet of the guys. There's probably at least 50 petrol bombs. Since Sunday, at least two people have been confirmed killed. They were shot dead. And uh, the protesters here shining torches up into the the buildings on the police sides looking for any cops that might want to shoot any protesters. In the early days of the protests, the opposition parties were influential on the streets. But now, after weeks of stagnation, protesters were getting tired of the continuing political stalemate. In my opinion, the situation in Ukraine is that we see the non-existence of our opposition, actually, only in the words, they are ready to call all the people to the situation, to the situation. А по факту, де кличко? Я не бачу тут ні кличка, ні оцінюка, ні тягнебока трьох лідерів опозиції України. So, Vitaly Klitschko, the leader of Udar party, one of the more popular opposition parties, has uh, finally come down to the barricades after his talk with Yanukovych. I mean, everyone here was expecting him not to turn up, but now he's here and everyone's kind of pissed off at him. Uh, everyone's shouting revolution. And they're sort of uh, interrupting everything he says get the feeling that people are just kind of pissed off with all these negotiations. They're calling for revolution here and they're not getting it. After trying to negotiate an extension of the ceasefire and constantly being shouted down, Klitschko finally gave up trying to talk with the protesters and retreated from the barricades. І це насправді з одного боку це дуже романтична боротьба, але з іншого боку ми розуміємо, що потрібно стояти до кінця, тому що далі вже нема куди відступати і саме тому я тут. Although the ceasefire was now over, the night passed peacefully with no clashes. You are brave to be here. Later that morning, we met up with Oleksiy Radzinski, an editor at the left-wing political critique magazine, to find out more about the internal politics of the Euromaidan movement. So this is where the riot started on Sunday. Yeah, exactly. This is and the place. these are new barricades that they've created since Sunday, right? Actually, I think they were created last night because in the previous days, the riot police made an attack and then retreated. So they were demonstrating that they can clear the square yeah. easily in 10 minutes, but they were retreating afterwards because there was no, not a political decision to end up in a bloodbath. Right. So, so you think, you know, the people that were killed, that wasn't an order from the top. What happened there? Why did those people get uh, shot? It was an order from the top, but uh, oh, right. we, don't, we are not exactly sure where the top is. <laughs> uh, at the end of this hierarchy oh, now is in Kremlin, not in presidential administration. There's not really much talk about sort of the political makeup of these protests. Yeah. Would you say there's any lean towards left or right here in Maidan? Yeah, for sure. Uh, but this, what we see now, I wouldn't really call this a protest anymore. This is an uprising and this is a people's uprising. 
It is kind of post-political. No political ideology is in control of this. For sure, uh, the far right was extremely visible from the very start of Euromaidan. But after the violence started on the side of the government, lots of people who would never accept their presence even here came here anyway because a much bigger problem is in the violence of the government. And uh, that's how also the neo-Nazi ideology becomes more acceptable. Unfortunately. So yesterday was a very important day because a number of regional administrations in Ukraine were occupied by protesters. Yeah. Some in the east are also occupied. In places like Sumy, which is the closest to Russia, right. there were also riots yesterday. Wow, and, okay. the, and the regional administration was nearly occupied, from what I know. There's been uh, talk of the army possibly stepping in to put a halt to the violence. I mean, do you think that's even really a realistic option? Do you think that will happen? Uh, for sure it's a realistic option, but it actually would be a conscious political decision to risk or start a civil war. We are the Ukraine, we are the peace. Soldiers, go to the army, and the conflict will not be. Go to the army. We are for you, not for them, we are for them, you understand? As the evening set in, we met up with Auto Maidan, the mobile arm of the Euromaidan protests, whose leader, Dmitry Bulatov, at the time was missing. The Auto Maidan volunteers patrolled the Maidan and the surrounding areas looking for hired government thugs known as Tatushki and camp out at hospitals protecting wounded activists from police brutality. A few days earlier, 12 members of Automaidan were themselves attacked by police and arrested. Due to the new protest law, they could face serious prison time. Vlod, one of the Automaidan drivers, offered to take us on a patrol and tell us about the movement. Vlad drove us to one of the emergency hospitals in Kiev, where some of those arrested were coming back from court to seek further treatment. Я думаю, выводить будет с той стороны, поэтому снимайте с той. So the police have turned up, and inside this van here are some Maidan protesters who've uh, who've been in court, but they were injured, and finally they're going to get to see some hospital treatment. Looks pretty cold in there. Supported by undercover officers, the police frog-marched the protesters quickly through the secure wing of the hospital. We followed behind in an attempt to find out what was going on. So each protester seems to have about four cops so escorting them inside to the hospital pretty quickly, pretty rough. We didn't manage, they were closed already. It was impossible. doesn't look like they want to play. <laughs> so the police took all the injured protesters in here, and this is the sort of uh, police wing of the hospital, and they don't let any of these Maidan protesters in. So who knows what's going on there. With the fate of the protesters uncertain, and Kiev abuzz with numerous reports of activists being abducted, we headed to meet Euromaidan SOS, a group of volunteers dedicated to tracking down the disappeared. So we have started this initiative on the 30th of November, the first day when the, um, on the Maidan Square students were beaten. And um, uh, we want to help with that legal aid. But unfortunately, or fortunately, we started to do almost everything. So your purpose is to help any Euromaidan activists who might be yes. in any legal trouble, or if they've been injured, or if, if they go missing? Yes, we have here more than 200 volunteers, and each day 20 guys coming here to work. This guy with this girl, they were calling missing persons. With the green lines, they are 
they at home or they just answered the call. Okay. And they're still they're still missing. And that's currently thirty people. Yes. And it, different stories about hospitals. There as well, the civil activists who are, tr who are there twenty four hours, mm -hmm. and they just can call us. And for example, they said this this person who, who was who was beaten, some policeman came and they want to take them out. Please help us. And in some cases, thanks to doctors, mm -hmm. they're trying to hide people. Hide people. Oh really? Has there been any cases where you've actually found the missing person, but they've ended up dead? Yes, he was kidnapped, beaten, and then he was found in the forest in your cave, uh, and he was dead because of the, um, the cold. Do people know who took him? I think we, s we see the great cooperation among police and um, criminals, yes. It's quite contradictive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, well, it's, it's a history shows and history repeating. Yeah. We'd heard that the clashes had started again, so we headed back to the barricades. OK, so we're back at Hreshkovo where clashes started a few hours ago. So we're going to head to the front barricades and see what's going on. There's thousands more people down here right now. From here you can see they've set fire to what looks like a lot of tyres. There's a, the smoke smothering the air right now. So right now there's thousands of people just kind of watching, looking towards the police lines, waiting to see what happens. It looks like they're just ready for a fight. They're waiting for the police to push forward. And there's a building right next, right, right next to that, currently barricaded, and that's now on fire too. It's called Louis Vuitton. There's, there's a man behind me, half naked, wielding a chainsaw. The police are firing rubber, rubber bullets in this direction, so we're having to move. Guys, why are you down here? It's actually very simple. We are fighting for our freedom, that's all. So what started the fight here tonight? Berkut, we didn't start any provocation. We were peaceful. And someone from their side shoot here. And then the fight started. Yeah, yeah, we don't care about the position. It's a political issue. All these people here, this is the future of this country. OK, this is the very front line of the barricades on Horeshkova Street. The protesters are shooting fireworks now towards the police. It's like a post-apocalyptic nightmare down here. It's insane. Went forward to try and get a couple of shots of these guys right at the front and the fire hose got me. I'm absolutely soaking. Might start freezing up in a minute. Whoa. Whoa. A cliched Brit drinking a bit of tea at a riot. Fighting's been going on now down here for at least three or four hours. There's thousands of people and more people are turning up all the time. If the police ever wanted to clear this place, they'd literally have to do it with bulldozers and thousands more of police than they actually have at their disposal. It's just mental down here. There's no way they could clear it right now. After hours of intense clashes, eventually things come down and the uneasy standoff continued. We'd been wondering about how well equipped and organised everyone was, so we decided to take a look at the various methods the protesters used to combat government forces. The guys here, they've brought along their own paintball guns. Uh, they've got some target practice on the wall at the back there. They're pretty good, they're getting in the middle of it. This is for paint inside the paint. Yeah. On the mask, officer and clothes. So, so you don't see, don't see nothing. So you guys, are, you yes, shoot them in the yes. face and they can't see anything? Yes. I got some shots in the middle. I can't say they'll get me into their ranks anytime soon, but they're okay. We then headed over to the occupied trade union house. Inside, we met Euromaidan Self Defense a group of volunteers who were responsible for making some of the makeshift weapons and shields. 
So you've got a, a homemade piece of armour here, a couple of layers of foam padding that you'd normally find on a, uh, a bedroll for camping. They've even got a groin flap, just so uh, no one gets hit in the, uh, the crown jewels. It's pretty cool. Let's see how heavy this thing is. And my own helmet, wow. <laughs> this is a Soviet army helmet. Where's the fight? Let's go. <laughs> We're heading up to the eighth floor where the self defense groups make their own shields. So, Yorema, tell me what you're doing here on the eighth floor. This is our workshop. And what are you making here? Uh, making shields and some armor. Like on uh, the chest, uh, we have. Like this? Yes, like uh -huh. this. Beautiful. It's a uh, stop uh, rubber or plastic bullet. Okay. And uh, bed. And what about the shields? We make uh, steel shields. Yeah. Like this. Yes. It's heavy. So, how long does it take you to make one of these shields? One shield, I think, 30 minutes. That's pretty, pretty quick turnaround. Yes. The size of the shield is like the yeah. policeman's uh, shield. So we bought the one shield and uh, <laughs> measured it out. Yes, yeah, copy. This is very heavy, actually. I, I'm surprised that people are able to hold it for so long. I don't think I'd be very good on the front line. <laughs> and what did you do before the revolution? My job, I am the organizer of uh, some events. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. And now you're uh, an armor maker. Uh, armor and uh, some salt soldier. Since protests began, a number of government buildings have been occupied by protesters. We went to meet Alexander Daniluk, the leader of Spinus Brava, the group responsible for the occupations, to find out more. Our aims uh, and our ideology is democratic uh, republic in Ukraine, which we have in our constitution, but unfortunately they don't have in practice. Our strategy is a strategy of non-violent resistance, occupying state buildings. There is no sense to continue a conversation with terrorist state, which is a threat for people. Sure. So only our tough behavior could change the situation, because now it's proxy war between Ukrainian people and Russian Federation and their puppet uh, regime here. So it's a war of independence. Are you afraid now that the government, that they'll just come after you? Yeah, I'm absolutely sure that this plan is launched and I can be captured in any minute or maybe do something worse. Today the anti-protest law was repealed, so what should Euromaidan do next to pressure the government? We need uh, a lot of people on the Grushevsky street who will be ready to occupy uh, central government bodies because it's just impossible to do something with people who use such strategy. It's very pity that our political leaders are big shit and that's why they just do nothing. The day after our interview with Danluk, Spinus Brava lost the agricultural ministry in a brutal fight with supporters of Svoboda. Whilst we were in Ukraine, Danluk's family had fled to the UK, and a week later Danluk joined them after walking across the border to Poland and flying to London. Мне 25 лет. Я давал частные уроки игры на фортепиано. Я не принадлежу никакой партии, но я разделяю взгляды как свободовцев, как правого сектора. Я разделяю, поддерживаю людей, которые на сегодняшний день действуют эффективно в этой борьбе. Я с первого дня находился на Грушевского, и на первых порах я не вел активных действий, ну, выносил, то есть, раненых. На вторую ночь я получил ранение, я получил э, травму, два ребра мне сломали. Я... What made you change from helping the injured to fighting the cops? 
Убили моего друга. Его звали Сергей Нигаян. Четыре пули, две в голову, одна в горло, одна в грудь. То есть он поступил уже мертвый в медпункт, его не спасли, спасти шансов не было. И после этого момента у меня как будто, как будто что-то внутри произошло, я просто перестал бояться вообще. Ирвинк был одним из многих активистов, которых мы встретили, объединившись в группах правых сил. Чтобы узнать больше о интенциях этих групп, мы встретились с Андреем Тарасенко, лидером представителем правого сектора, одной из более милитарных групп, борьбы на фронт-лайне. Правый сектор – это объединение разных всеукраинских организаций, групп людей разноманитных и просто людей доброй воли. Правый сектор создался в первые дни Майдана, чтобы заявить свою националистическую позицию. Нам не столько интересно подписание ассоциации, или не подписание ассоциации с ЕС, сколько скинение этого бандитского режима шляхом национальной революции. What are the right sector's physical roles on the barricades? Займаємося захистом людей від звірілого берегу. Ми кругом захищаємо людей. Де є люди, там є ми. Якщо нас називати екстремістами, тоді треба весь народ називати екстремістами. Можна подивитися на фотографію, на якій стоїть декілька десятків тисяч людей. Всі екстремісти. Do you see there being a peaceful negotiation here in Maidan? Іде війна. Нас стріляють, нас вбивають, нас катують, викрадають, саджають масово, гвалтують. Не може бути мирного розрішення. Єдиний варіант, варіант мирно це все закінчити, це якщо Янукович подасть відставку. What will the right sector do if the government declares state of emergency? Якщо цей режим розпочне реальний терор по всій Україні проти власного народу, тоді почнеться партизанська війна. Друзі, вхід з правої сторони, будь ласка. Behind us is a Ukraine house and earlier today the police took it over. About an hour or so ago we were watching television and thousands of protesters have turned up to try and take it back. Okay, it's, it's about 20 rows deep of protesters, you can't really get very close. Firing fireworks inside the building, all the, all the glass is completely shattered now. The police are using a fire hose to spread the, spread the protesters. I mean, again, it's really, really cold, so it's just going to freeze. Things have calmed down a little. Police aren't shooting everyone with the water cannon and no one's firing any bricks or fireworks inside. The guy with a megaphone has just gone up to the front. Maybe they're going to go try and negotiate some sort of ceasefire. So the protesters have opened up a corridor on the steps in front of the building. The police inside have surrendered, so they're going to let them out and then retake the Ukraine house. If I was a policeman, I wouldn't want to run this gauntlet. It's pretty intimidating. <laughs> Even with the truce agreed and ambulances arriving to treat the wounded, the police decided it was still not safe to come out the front. Instead, they sneaked out the back, leaving the protesters to occupy Ukraine House. The next day, Ukraine House was firmly under the control of the protesters, and a vast team of volunteers were cleaning up and repairing the damage done the previous night. When the protesters took back this building, they found sort of spent ammunition cartridges, saying that this was possibly where police yeah. fired on protesters. Do you think there's any sort of truth to that? Knowing our police methods, it's 
pretty imaginable situation. <laughs> So what's that the symbol on the wall with the sort of red and black cross? Who are these guys? The abbreviation means Ukrainian National Self-Defense. And this is the organization which is like paramilitary organization from the beginning of the 90s. And during the Chechen wars, Rebels. they fought oh, wow. for the independence of Chechnya. But recently, for 10 years, they kind of a peaceful nationalist party. So what are they doing here at the Euromaidan protests? On the front line, uh, there is a so-called uh, right uh, sector and uh, they are of this a little bit violent organizations. Right. So you have paramilitary organization with military experience on the front lines of the Euromaidan protests? Uh, yes, but I don't think they're the, the main uh, factor in, uh, in the whole uh, uh, right sector. Sure. That's it? Okay, okay. At that point, perhaps due to the topic of the conversation, we were asked to stop filming by a scary-looking protester in military combats. So we moved outside where a large group had gathered. Mikhail Zhivaneski, 25, was killed on Horeshkovo Street during clashes with the police. He was a member of the Ukrainian People's Self-Defense, the right-wing paramilitary group we'd already seen in Ukraine House. Again, this highlighted the worrying presence of the far right within Euromaidan. With demonstrations spreading across the country, the repealing of the anti-protest law and the city hall being evacuated as part of a prisoner amnesty law, it felt like the protests had entered a more peaceful phase. However, on the 18th of February, violent clashes kicked off again outside Parliament, which so far has left 25 dead and hundreds injured, and the prospect of Independence Square being cleared for good, a worrying reality.